Thank you very much. First up, well done to you all. Last session, last day, you're still here, you're still standing, pat on the back, well done. Um, okay, so my uh, presentation has a rather abstract title, uh, Mapping the Informal Jurisprudence. So what we just heard from Claire is what I would describe as the formal uh, juristic, uh, jurisprudence. I think you describe it as soft law, um, but uh, I call it the informal system, if you like. So what I'll be talking about is actually fairly grounded, although idealistic. So I do have a specific proposal to, uh, to put to you, which is for a private ordering system that would bring justice to uh, the victims in global supply chains or global production processes, the victims of that process. And more specifically still, I'll be proposing that there should be something like a Global Industries Ombudsman Service. That's a mouthful. Global Industries Ombudsman Service. I've had a lot of experience in the <coughs> domestic legal systems or the domestic systems in which there are ombudsman services which can take complaints against banks and financial providers and telecommunications industry, uh, uh, industries and so on. So the idea is to take that basic model, map it onto an international forum, but the complainants would be workers and others affected by global industries. And the aim would be to overcome some of the jurisdictional problems that we have with the hard law, some of which has been described by Claire. So uh, I'd be in, if anyone is intrigued or interested uh, in what I talk about today and want to contact me, I'd be very interested in any ideas, any contacts, any anything. Uh, you can contact me on justin.malvin justin .malvin at monash.edu. So, here's my pitch. So, the idea is to uh, establish this Global Industries Ombudsman Service and to succeed in that, there's two elements. One is you need the industries on board which is no easy thing, that's the first step. And the second thing is to map the jurisprudence, the informal jurisprudence, which is somewhat chaotic at this stage, so that there is some basis upon which the system can function. So let's just define the problem uh, a little bit further. The issue is that the victims of human rights abuses in global production processes are for victims with some rare exceptions that uh, Claire has mentioned, it's extremely difficult for them to gain any recompense. Um, I'm focusing on global corporations, first because they're great defendants, they've got money, uh, and secondly, they are the throughput of the clothes we wear um, and, and, and many of the other items that we have, which in many cases are produced by slave labour and victims, for which we benefit, the global corporations benefit, and I would, would think in some ways we are complicit in, uh, the, in, in the abuses that are taking place through the uh, conduit of these global corporations. And the sorts of corporations I'm talking about are those in the areas of apparel, mining companies, food and beverage, <coughs> and there's, a great, there's an extensive list beyond that. Now, as we've gone, we've heard from Claire, it isn't so difficult for global corporations to, to elude the formal legal system in terms of redressing any harms. And so they're able to use uh, subcontracting arrangements and a whole range of other uh, processes to avoid any meaningful liability for harms that they do. And as I say, we are complicit in all this. So they cause abuses in their production processes uh, and various ways this is done is through forced labour, child labour, uh, employment of workers in dangerous and unhealthy workplaces, underpayment, uh, deprivation of rights to join unions. For example, in Guatemala, uh, they tend to execute union leaders. That's just their little way of uh, kind of bringing a little order to the, uh, to the situation. Um, and also the subjection of workers to harassment and abuse. And the class of people affected by this is significant. 
Um, the ILO conservatively estimated that we're dealing with more than 20 million people that are subjected to coercion, deception and human trafficking. More specifically still, uh, not so long ago, the BBC did an investigation. They found that there were Turkish textile factories exploiting child labour to the extent that they were using seven and eight year old children working 60 hour weeks. Uh, Syrian refugees were a great target for exploitation in these global supply chains. Um, and uh, we can see here a number of UK companies that were found to be linked to uh, production houses using forced labour. <clears throat> uh, the difficulties uh, with the formal system, some again, which I mentioned by Claire, is the difficulty in, in seeking remedies in the home country for a whole lot of reasons I probably don't need to rehearse, and also uh, trying to bring action in the home country uh, is somewhat difficult. So, what is... This is not suggesting we're replacing what we have, but uh, perhaps complementing what we have. Wouldn't it be great if we had global corporations first up accepting responsibilities that extend beyond their formal legal liabilities? What if they accepted responsibilities beyond that? That's the first thing. And secondly, what if uh, they voluntarily had a system for compensating the victims of that abuse? The first uh, part, uh, voluntarily, voluntarily accepting responsibility, is increasingly occurring, but it's, it's occurring in a way that is, is somewhat chaotic, um, as we'll see in a minute. Is somewhat chaotic. So I think we need, and this is a, process, a project that I uh, will uh, engage myself with others in, and that is trying to bring some coherence uh, to this outburst that we have at the moment of voluntarily acceptance of responsibility. But for all the voluntarily, voluntary acceptance of responsibility that's going on, there's very, very few cases in which there's compensation or any form of remedy being provided to the harmed parties. So this is where uh, the latest um, developments are not succeeding. So we're talking about a voluntary system in which global corporations will commit themselves to providing compensation to harmed parties. So why would they do it? There was a couple of reasons. One is there's a reputational risk that they face at the moment. Uh, the, the tainting of their uh, brand, their brand name. Uh, the Rana Plaza is the, uh, one of the classics uh, in which 1,300 people were killed with a fa factory uh, collapse in Bangladesh where they were making uh, clothes for H&M, uh, Primark, Zara and so on. Uh, and also there have been many other successful campaigns by NGOs and other civil society groups that have, brought, that have embarrassed uh, and put at risk the reputation of those major global firms. So that's one reason they might want some fairly um, uh, high profile uh, and orderly system for <coughs> providing remedies. Secondly, there's a, there's a political and re regulatory risk if these corporations do nothing. Um, and we've in recent times seen the uh, Californian Transparency and Supply Chains Act, the UK Modern Slavery Act, the French uh, Duty of Diligence legislation, Netherlands Child Labour Due Diligence legislation. They're the first step. What's interesting about these uh, measures is they're holding global corporations at least requiring them to report on what they're doing in their uh, global supply chains, uh, but they're extending jurisdiction to firms that aren't even... Uh, located in Britain. Uh, it's just that if they supply goods or services to Britain and, there are, uh, and their global turnover exceeds a certain threshold, that is sufficient to trigger legislative um, capture. So they do have, uh, there is a, a concern for business that that legislation, having, having reached that beachhead, would extend liability. So I've talked about a voluntary remedial system, uh, which I've called this Global Industries Ombudsman Service. This is modelled on, very approximately, on a successful um, domestic 
uh, system that's developed over the last four decades in which complainants, consumers can run free complaints against a bank or a telecommunications company in which they can take their complaint for free, at no cost, uh, even if they lose, all funded by industry, in which an independent, industry-funded ombudsman will hear their disputes and make a decision, and that decision is binding by contract on the firm. And I've been on an ombudsman service myself, a financial industry, a financial ombudsman service, and we could make uh, orders of compensation in the order of 100, well, no, up to three hundred thousand dollars. So quite serious amounts of money uh, can be ordered, and the company has to comply. But if the consumer loses, that's okay; they can take their matter off to court, so they don't lose their right uh, to take legal proceedings. So the idea of having corporations both responsible and being engaged in some kind of uh, informal system, I've got five minutes here, um, is that um, businesses, it is suggested under the UN guiding principles or proposed uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights that they should establish and participate in a grievance mechanism for individuals uh, that are, are affected. There are other international documents that are out there requiring that uh, industries take responsibilities beyond their narrow uh, formal legal uh, liability. There are voluntary codes that uh, uh, are being produced at the moment in which extend beyond formal legal liability. The guiding principles point to, even though they don't specifically mention any global industries ombudsman service, but under principle 31 they talk about the sorts of things that a remedial system should have. It should be legitimate, accessible, predictable and rights compatible. Uh, the ombudsman can be established by a charter, a separate company with a board which would have an equal number of uh, industry members and NGOs uh, on the board. Um, the present jurisprudence... Now, once Imagine we have this ombudsman. The next question is, what is the jurisdiction of the ombudsman? So we've got an ombudsman based somewhere in the world, Singapore or somewhere in Asia or Europe or wherever. And uh, so the ombudsman can hear disputes. It's a contractual thing which is binding on the, uh, the corporation. But what's the scope of the, of the, uh, of the jurisdiction? And if we look at the existing documents like the, um, the ILO document or the OECD or the UN guiding principles, they're kind of vague, vague about the reach of uh, the corporation's responsibility. And for a lawyer, that's uh, unsettling. It's too vague. Uh, for example, you can see that um, under the ILO's uh, document, it says that the corporation should be responsible for abuses that occur within its own competence. What does that mean? Uh, with the OECD, with which it is involved, um, OECD and UN guiding principles, in the context of its own activities, and finally, um, uh, within its own operations. So the issues that we have is that if there were an ombudsman, we'd need to establish a charter which would tell the ombudsman what their jurisdiction is, and the sorts of issues are how far does the responsibility of the company go? Is it to their subcontractors, or is it go all the way back to the cotton grower for the T-shirt? What are the compensation limits? Is it one hundred, two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars? What kind of harms can be compensated in the case of uh, Barack Gold, a mining company in Papua New Guinea? where the uh, guards of that mining company were raping the local Papua New, New Guinean women, they set up a, um, an informal complaint system in which they were awarding monetary compensation uh, for the affected woman, women. And finally, uh, an issue that has to be dealt with is the evidential requirements. For example, this is my last point, um, the evidential requirements will not always be easy. And this was illustrated in this recent case of US against Guatemala, in which the US ran a case against Guatemala for breaching the um, uh, Central American United States Free Trade Agreement, in which it required that Guatemala comply with its own labour laws. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Guatemala had a, has a habit of uh, killing labour leaders, apart from anything else. 
and the United States failed in its arbitration. Part in, and one of the areas it failed was in collecting witness statements. Uh, they couldn't put the name of the witnesses because they were too scared that if they had their name on it and that went to the other side, being the Guatemalan government in that arbitration, then the Guatemalan uh, government would single those witnesses out for intimidation. And so without witness names on those statements, the arbitral body couldn't pay couldn't have regard to them because it couldn't, as a matter of due process, be shown to the other side and be challenged. So these are the sorts of issues that will also come up when we map out the informal jurisprudence. Thank you.